she gets a mention in here, so she wants to be a part of it. Oh. <laughs> Sip and sick kid sick. So yeah, I'm Sierra, and I'm going to present a case that I had recently, or, well, last fall. It's an atypical presentation of a total spinal. First of all, uh, who hasn't done any neuroxyl yet? Don't be shy, it kind of, kind of takes a while. Okay. All right, so the setting of this case, I was in my specialty obstetrics rotation, and I was on a high-risk labor and delivery unit in Sacramento, and it was uh, week five out of a six-week rotation, so I was kind of towards the end of it. Um, by this point, I had done roughly 60 epidurals um, and quite a bit of spinal for C-sections, and up until this point, I hadn't really had any neuroaxial complications, so I don't know, I was like in unicorn land, things were going great, and um, I was loving it. So here's my patient, a 42-year-old female, G4P3, and she was not the unicorn that I had hoped to find. Um, her admitting diagnosis was leg swelling and pregnancy, and she was in her third trimester, transferred from a high-risk um, L&D um, for preterm labor. Her history was with polysubstance abuse, during pregnancy, and she'd used amphetamines, heroin, methadone, and she was also a chronic hep C. And upon physical assessment in the room, um, her lower extremities were really red, very swollen. Um, she had limited range of motion because they were very painful. And she was lethargic, but um, she was cooperative, a little bit slow to respond, and she was requesting a labor epidural. So, 1550, um, I positioned her for the procedure, and she had difficulty moving because she was in active labor and she was in a lot of pain. Um, so I took two nurses and myself to get her in position. Her speech was slow and minimal, but it was appropriate. And just recently, she had 100 mics of fentanyl given IV um, prior to transfer, and maybe that was con you know, contributing to her lethargy. So 10 minutes later, I placed my epidural, and I had crisp loss of resistance at about six centimeters, seemed appropriate. My catheter threaded really easily. I aspirated back, no CSF, which would have indicated a wet tap, and no blood. And in case, I think most of you should know what a wet tap is by now, but um, we'll get to that, and it's not a good sign. So for the procedure, um, I went ahead and gave her her test dose. It was three cc's of a 1% uh, Lido with Epi. And I asked her, are you having any leg weakness, tinnitus, metallic taste in your mouth, or dizziness? She pretty much denied, but she was lethargic and the nurse kind of had to encourage answers out of her. Um, there was no vital signs changes, which would have indicated that it was intervascular. I dosed the catheter, I did eight, eight mLs of the 1% and two mLs of fentanyl, so my total dose was about 10 mLs, and I divided it up into five mLs at a time, about three minutes apart. Total volume that went in was 13 mLs. Went ahead and started her on the continuous infusion, which is standard for this hospital, um, a 0.125% bupivacaine with fentanyl at 12 uh, mLs per hour. So it started to get a little bit suspicious. We repositioned her. Uh, my attending was out of the room, and the CRNA that I was working with were gone, but I wanted to be a good CRNA student, so I stuck around, and I helped the nurse reposition her. Um, when we laid her flat, she said she was short of breath and was having a hard time breathing. We quickly repositioned her, um, got her up to 30 degrees of head of bed, and we did some uterine displacement, repositioned her. Um, my initial thought was that um, those of you who haven't had OB yet, when you're laying flat and you're pregnant, the gravid uterus compresses and you get aortic cable compression, re uh, reduced venous return, and then the diaphragm pushes up on the lungs, so I just suspected this was a positioning issue. Um, vital signs were unchanged. She said she felt fine when I left the room, and at 1620, I followed up to the attending anesthesiologist, and I quote, I said, I didn't go back to chuckle a level of guac, but she appeared fine when I left. And that was after telling the doc that she'd gotten short of breath. So five minutes later, literally five minutes to the doc, all three of us get paged back to the bedside. And now I have a patient that's severely attended, shallow respirations, hypotensive. We stopped the epidural. I took out a three cc syringe and I aspirated back on the catheter. So. What did we observe when I asked for the catheter? <laughs> okay, let's hold on a second, because not all of you have had your neuroaxial. We'll do a quick review. So neuroaxial
axial anatomy review, we're talking about the meninges. You've got the pia mater, which is the closest to the spinal cord. You can only see it with a microscope. The next layer up, you've got the arachnoid mater, and like Dr. Lewis says, it's spider-like. It's a little bit, um, it's not as durable as such as the dura mater, which is on the outside. So for our purposes, um, for an epidural, obviously we're going on the outside of the dura. If you pierce the dura, you're probably gonna get a wet cap. Um, for our spinal blocks or subarachnoid blocks, you are going in between that arachnoid and pia mater. Um, one more picture that just kind of emphasizes, I used the sword because the first time you hold your epidural needle, you think you're holding a sword. <laughs> Very large. Um, so you can see here this like uh, reddened area, I mean, I guess more vascular, you can see that that's a big space that you can get to for your epidural space. If you go a little bit further, you can see the dura mater, the arachnoid, subarachnoid, and pia. And your cerebrospinal fluid is gonna be in that subarachnoid space where you would get CSF if you were doing a spinal subarachnoid block, not an epidural. Um, so really quick, when you do your spinal or if you were to have a wet cap, you're gonna see CSF. Your medication there directly bathes the nerves, so you get this really fast onset. It's a very profound block, and it's a very small space. So here you should only be putting like one or two cc's of fluid. When you're doing an epidural, the diffusion has to go across the dura, so you get a slower onset. The block is less profound, less sympathectomy, and it's a large space, so you're using a large volume, like maybe 13 cc's. So, what did we get? <laughs> So CSF was noted upon aspiration with a 3CT syringe. I turned the nerve stimulator all the way up. We discovered my patient's block was up to a C4. The patient was experiencing a total spinal, and I'm pretty sure my face looked just like that. <laughs> so uh, just to refresh here, what's a higher total spinal? So it's when you get a large volume or a high dose or concentration of your local anesthetic and it goes into the subarachnoid or the subdural space, and it ends up spreading more cephalad than you intend. Mm -hmm. And what I found, the difference of a high spinal versus a total is that when you have a high spinal and then your patient loses consciousness, like my patient, you get a total spinal. So signs and symptoms are gonna relate to the level of the block, and for those of you that haven't had OD yet or just haven't seen this done, you start with your nerve stimulator before a C-section, and you start about where the incision's gonna be, T11, T12, and you start at one and you put it on tetany and you go all the way up to 10. And your patient maybe feels some vibration and that's it. And you work your way up. And typically I say our patients have a T4, even a T2 block before they start to feel anything. So that's a surgical level block, you're ready for a C-section. So essentially my patient had a block to C4. Ready for maybe open heart surgery, I don't know. <laughs> So just going through, it starts at T1 to T11, you lose your intercostal muscles, which is expected. I usually tell my patients, hey, you're gonna feel short of breath a little bit. Totally normal, it's your chest wall that's losing that you know, innervation, but you've got your diaphragm, don't worry, you're gonna do fine. <laughs> okay, then you go up, you've got T1 to T4, you get bradycardia, hypotension, it's your cardio accelerator. You know, you'll see some hypotension and bradycardia when you get once you get to C5 to T1, you're talking about your brachial plexus. Their arms are gonna be weak, and depending on how high and how dense it is, they might lose total motor innervation there. As you go up to C3, C5, uh, you get de decreased diaphragmatic excursion um, from the vagus nerve, and then you also get your superior and your inferior laryngeal nerves, and their airway is gonna relax. Um, they're gonna get dyspneic and they're gonna have respiratory distress. And now that you've gotten both respiratory and cardiac, you're looking at risk for ACLS, um, intubation, kind of some serious things. Um, oh, excuse me, and then cervical brainstem intracranial. As I said, you get relax relaxation of the airway, dysphonia. Um, you get a dilated non-reactive pupil because you lose the parasympathetic after an innervation. But if you're giving an opioid in your medication, you might see constricted pupils lose consciousness, and there's also reports of uh, Horner syndrome. And in fact, Aura told me a situation that she did a block and had only the Horner syndrome, but that was her indication that something was wrong. So what happened with me? I had an uneventful placement of an epidural. Initially, I had no CSF. Didn't think I had a wet cap. 
There was no sense of disinfecting or loss of mobility. And there's a 20 minute window from the placement of the block to getting CSF back and having this crazy block. Like, did I have a wet tap and not catch it? And I was feeling horrible about it. So I went to Orador, which is actually for a Bollinger. Um, you guys, if you haven't had her yet, you will. And you will see this lecture slide at some point again. So I went to Aura, feeling horrible. I have this wet tap. How did I miss it? Like, I could kill somebody. How did this happen? And what ended up happening, or it helped me realize, is that I actually had a subdural block. It wasn't subarachnoid, it's actually subdural. And it may have actually migrated to subarachnoid probably when I was repositioning my patient. And I thought I'd never heard of this before, but in Aura's defense, it's in her lecture slides in her axial from her semester. I went back and I reviewed it. So a subdural injection, we don't talk about it a lot because it's really, really rare. Um, it's never our goal to end up in the subdural spot, but how can it happen? If you're doing a spinal or a subarachnoid block and your spinal needle isn't fully advanced into the subarachnoid space, this is you can get a subdural block. And I know some of us, like our first rotations talked about these patchy spinals that we've gotten. And at the time I couldn't really figure out why they were patchy and uneven. They probably were subdural and not subarachnoid. During an epidural, like what I did, um, you can inadvertently inject medication into the subdural space after catheter malplacement. It could happen after an epidural, even hours later, if your epidural catheter ends up migrating into the subdural space um, in defects in the dura, there are case reports of that. So if it occurs while you're placing an epidural, <laughs> your catheter is gonna be negative for CSF, your testose is gonna be negative, you're gonna administer your local anesthetic totally normally, and you're definitely gonna walk out feeling like a rock star, like I did. There's gonna be a delay of about 10 to 25 minutes, and then you're gonna get a sudden excessive spread of your block. The spread is gonna be slower than a spinal, but faster than an epidural, and that's because when you're doing your subarachnoid block, you're only getting through the pia mater, so you get this really fast block. When you're doing an epidural, your medication has to get through the pia, the arachnoid, and the dura, or in the other direction, dura, arachnoid, and pia, before it really absorbs into the, to the nerve roots. Subdural space is kind of between that, the pia and arachnoid, and so it's kind of an intermediate onset. It initiates with a sensory block, and it's typically less motor block, and the reason for that is that your subdural space, anatomy-wise, is actually larger posteriorly. Um, and if you remember, sensory is dorsal, motor is ventral, and so you end up getting more sensory. You may or may not get more profound motor, but it's definitely gonna spread more sensory. You get relative sparing of the ventral nerve roots, oh, and then anterior lateral sympathetic fibers are somewhat effective. So you're gonna get a hypotension, but probably less than a subarachnoid block or an unrecognized wet tap. The space extends from S2 and actually goes all the way up to the floor of your fourth ventricle. So despite positioning, um, it'll track cephalad. Um, the respiratory signs are gonna be gradual and onset. It's gonna start with some incoordination and then go to dyspnea. Um, like I talked about pupillary dilation, eventually loss of consciousness, and you get a really extensive spread of the block because of the limited capacity in the subdural space. It's not like the epidural space, so you're getting a very large volume in a tight space that's gonna spread up. Radiologists have found this space under fluoroscopy and they found that when you inject fluid here, it's gonna ascend against gravity, so you're kind of out of luck. 7%, um, there's a study that shows 7% of the time um, an epidural needle was at least partially placed subdural and that was confirmed by x-ray. A retrospective study showed over 2,000 lumbar epidurals, the incidence was 0.82%. But recently, um, there's recent literature suggesting it can be anywhere from 0.006% up to as high as 17%. Because it's challenging to diagnose, and there's a lot of people that don't know about it, quite a few of the preceptors I was working with really didn't know about it as well, um, the incidence could be higher. So what happened? I placed my catheter subdural. At some point, it may have migrated to subarachnoid, and the reason I think that is because I had a late onset block, like a subdural. My block was pretty pro profound, though, and it didn't seem to be patchy at all, which makes me think at some point it repositioned to subarachnoid. So what did we do? We repositioned the patient, and we put him in a high fowlers, thinking that gravity would help the situation, but my research later on found probably doesn't help. We did optimize the airway. We suctioned, put her in a sniffing position, did a shoulder roll and gave her a jollet. 
I have all my emergency supplies prepared. I pulled the card in. Amzavag, my favorite learning scope, my ET tube, emergency drugs were on hand, fluid wide open to support my hemodynamics. And in, an, in the end, we only gave 25 milligrams of ephedrine, but we talked about doing a dopamine infusion if we needed to continue treating. We frequently reassessed the levels of loss of the nerve stimulator. I basically didn't want to take the nerve stimulator off of her. I needed to know just where the block was going. So one hour and 15 minutes, my patient opens her eyes finally. She's lethargic. She starts answering simple questions. And then finally, we noticed the block was receding and I could breathe again. So recommendations that I found, there's not a lot of clear guidelines for management. You definitely need to monitor them closely after neuraxial. You can reassess them frequently, remove and possibly relocate the catheter. If you're planning on doing a subarachnoid block after the fact, you need to expect cephalad spread, and that's because you filled up this subdural space. And when you do your subarachnoid dose, it's gonna spread a lot higher. So just anticipate what you've done to the spaces and how that's gonna affect your future anesthetics. And then if you're gonna use succinylcholine like we would have, use it cautiously because it can induce severe bradycardia if you've already got a high block. What I would do differently, improve my epidural skills, go slower, small advances, I like to use continuous pressure, so I've, I've been working on that technique. Aspirate from the catheter using an empty syringe. This is very, very important. Um, when I aspirated my test dose, I did have a full three cc's of test, and it didn't give me as much space in the syringe. Um, so there were times I thought maybe I just missed the CSF because I wasn't using an empty syringe. And I highlight this next one because I'm so ashamed of it. Check your level of block when the patient you know, noted dyspnea with positioning. It was like my spidey sense telling me that something was off and the right thing to do would have been to check the levels of the block and I didn't. And, and this was a situation, luckily she did okay, but um, we could have caught it earlier on and anticipated what was gonna happen. And I was under the direction of our attending anesthesiologist and she didn't wanna intubate, but after reading a lot about it and talking to a lot of providers, I feel like the safest thing would have been to intubate her. Although she maintained her airway, I'm certain that she wasn't protecting it and she's high risk for vomiting, being pregnant, and aspiration. And I just don't really see how you could argue that um, should she have aspirated, like, there's no argument as to why you didn't protect her airway. I think that would be a safer thing too. Finally, despite all your best efforts, a subdural catheter placement could still occur. So monitor your patients with vigilance, educate your nursing staff because they're your eyes and ears, and it was the nurse that paged us for the bedside, so they need to know that these changes can happen later on and what to look for. Um, if your patient has predisposing factors, um, which would be, I had included it and removed it, it would be previous back surgery um, and abnormal back anatomy and difficult catheter placement. Um, have a high suspicion that your catheter might not be where you think it is. Um, early, detection, early detection can prevent complications. Much to my relief, it turned out it wasn't an unrecognized wet tap, but don't worry, the very next day I had my first real live wet tap, so welcome to our life. Any questions? Ben. At what point did you take the catheter out? So uh, the, the arch shift ended shortly after, and they ended up not pulling the catheter. They left it, and they were going to treat it like a subarachnoid block, like a spinal catheter, and just dose it accordingly. Um, but at that time, nobody had talked about it being a subdural block. They were thinking subarachnoid. And some of the research that I found um, says that you shouldn't leave it if you think it's subdural because it's going to be an unpredictable patchy block. And you're, you can't anticipate the spread. So you have to be really certain that it's um, subarachnoid if you're going to leave it there and, and treat it. She, yeah. Yeah, Kevin? And I assume the baby did all right? Yeah, so I found out a couple hours later she delivered and they pulled that catheter and she did fine, baby did fine. Monitoring the whole time? What was that? Oh yeah, they were monitoring the whole time. Um, there were some non-reassuring signs obviously when she initially got hypotensive bradycardic, but she recovered and I heard that she pushed the baby out fine and along they went. Uh, Daryl. Sure, I, you know what, I didn't read anything about having like a postural puncture headache. I didn't, I didn't find any reports of that. Um, so we talked about dopamine because depending on your dose and literature, you can get 
get both alpha and beta. And if you're talking about, um, so whatever level the block is at, you're gonna get vasodilation at that level, and then you're also getting bradycardia with the block, and so the dopamine can get both the alpha and the beta receptors and be a good continuous support. Yeah? So when you talk about the cardiovascular spine, do we see, when you have a high spinal, something like this, or subarachnoid right block, so what causes those signs when you see like a cardiovascular? Sure, like the T1 to T4. Sure. Um, so like I said, you lose the cardio accelerators, and so T1 to T4, you're getting your sympathetic innervation to the heart, and then you're blocking that, and what's left to override is just the parasympathetic, and you get bradycardia. And then, like I said, the vasodilation at all, you know, at all levels that are affected. And I did read that um, the venous is, is greater vasodilation than arterial, significant reduction in preload. So you've got bradycardia, you know, with this overriding parasympathetic tone and then the vasodilation. Um, and then you also get the um, Jessel reflex, Jessel Zero reflex. And so the stretch and uh, pressure receptors, I think it's in the left ventricle, um, they recognize that they're not getting enough uh, volume back in, and it actually causes more bradycardia in an attempt to increase your diastolic filling time. So you get in this vicious cycle of profound hypotension and bradycardia. Nice. <laughs>